These are statements of, of who we are, what we care about, who we want to connect ourselves to, what kind of image we want to present to our world. In 100 Years, 100 Objects, stories from the collections of Lancaster City Museums, we're delving into the collections to discover objects that can tell us stories about the past and make us think about the present and future. I'm Rachel Roberts, Collections Registrar at Lancaster City Museums. Today's object is something that many visitors to Lancaster City Museum walk under without noticing the fascinating story it can tell. It's an object that gives us information about Roman Britain, both through the words that are on it and the ones that aren't. Today's object is an inscription from a Roman bathhouse. The stone is about 115 centimetres by 55 centimetres, and it features a carved message in Latin. It is broken, with a crack down the middle and a piece missing on the left-hand side. On the right side, there is a decoration of two dolphins, although to modern eyes, they are not immediately recognisable. The stone dates from between the years 262 and 266 Common Era, but it was found in 1812 in the garden of a house in Lancaster. We spoke to Dr Ellery Cousins, lecturer in Roman history at Lancaster University, to find out more about this object and what it can tell us about Roman Lancaster. She started off by telling us what the inscription says and where it came from. It's an inscription, it's a dedicatory inscription recording the restoration of two buildings by soldiers serving in Lancaster. Two buildings, a basilica, and we're not actually quite sure what that building what that building means in this context, it's been debated by historians, and a bathhouse. Um, and the inscription says that these were restored from the ground level because they had collapsed through age. And that they've been restored for the troopers of the cavalry regiment of Sabosians that were serving at Lancaster, and also for an emperor, uh, and we'll get to that in a minute, which emperor this was, and that this was done um, under the governor of the province, a man named Octavius Sabinus, who was a senator, under the charge of the commanding officer of the prefect of cavalry, of of this cavalry unit at Lancaster, a man named Flavius Amalsius, and that this happened on August 27th, in the year of the consulship of two men named Censor and Lepidus, who were being consul for the second time. And this is how the Romans uh, wrote down dates and sort of recorded dates, as they would say, this was the year in which these consuls were consuls, and consuls were sort of the, the, the top-ranking kind of officials of the Roman state underneath the emperor. One thing to notice about the text that you'll notice when you look at this inscription, and we'll come on to this later, is that parts of the inscription, parts of the text seem to have been kind of chiseled out or erased. Um, And this is a really important part of the story of this inscription and kind of what happened to it. Ellery went on to tell us what was known about when and why the inscription was put up and how figuring these facts out tell us that Lancaster was part of a breakaway alternative Roman Empire. This inscription records the restoration of a bathhouse and basilica by some soldiers. When was this? Where was this building? And and what was their relationship to the fort at Lancaster? Our only real clues to these circumstances come from the text of this inscription and its fine spot. And there's been a lot of debate amongst historians about what bathhouse this refers to, what this basilica is, like that's a conversation that is quite a complicated one so we'll leave it to one side but the bathhouse in particular as you know our most visible really roman site in lancaster is a bathhouse so you think is this inscription recording the restoration of that bathhouse and the answer is well probably not actually we think that this is recording a second bathhouse that we've only occasionally spotted during rescue excavations and we think that this was a another bathhouse that was in fact the bathhouse of the fort so the bathhouse that you see today in Lancaster we think that that was associated with a quite sort of grand residence that may have been the residence of someone important living in Lancaster an important official or or, or an inn or something like that. But every Roman fort had its own bathhouse for the use of the soldiers. And that bathhouse was always sort of right outside the fort gates. And the fine spot of this inscription fits with uh, where we think the bathhouse for the Roman fort would have been, sort of right outside the east gate of the fort. And as I mentioned uh 
in the 19th century when it was found, they also found other archaeological remains that looked like they came from a bathhouse. So bits of a bathhouse's heating system, tiles that we know are sort of used in bathhouses. When? Well, this is where those erasures come in. And that consular date, remember I said we've got these consuls, Censor and Lepidus. Now, we have in the texts that have come down to us from the Roman Empire, lists of the consuls. One of the big mysteries about this inscription when it appeared is that we had never heard of these guys before. They do not appear on any consular list that we have for the Roman Empire. And so for a long time, historians tried to find a solution for this, said, oh, well, maybe they weren't the main consuls for the year. None of this was very satisfying. And finally, in the 1930s, a man named Eric Burley realised the solution. In the third century, Britain and other parts of the Western Roman Empire, what is now modern day France, bits of Spain, broke away from the main Roman Empire. And for a couple of decades, were under the leadership of usurper emperors who basically had a kind of exact sort of mini replica of the Roman Empire under their control in the Western Empire, including consuls, including governors, you know, including all of the kind of officials of the Roman state that we know about from from the Roman Empire. They just sort of recreated that in the West in this kind of breakaway empire. These guys, Kensor and Lepidus, must in fact have been consuls of this breakaway Roman Empire between AD 262 and 266. 262 to 266 in particular, the emperor in question of this breakaway Gallic Empire was a man named Posthumus. What more is known about Posthumus, and why, if he was emperor, does his name not appear on the stone? Remember I said there were erasures. And the text of this inscription, you know, when we reconstruct the Latin of it, it's clear that it's recording the dedication of this bathhouse for both this unit, but also in the name of and for the emperor. But there's no emperor's name here. The emperor's name has been chiselled out. Emperors who, after their death, are deemed to have been not the best, the bad guys, we often see their names being erased from inscriptions. And actually erasing the name in that way, but leaving the inscription up, is a really potent message of this kind of post-mortem judgment of these guys. Um, So there are two erasures. The first is the, the actual name of the emperor, And then the second is in the title of the unit, the military unit that's setting it up, the Ala Sabusiana. And then there's an erasure. And what we think would have been there before it was erased was the word Postumiana, Postumus' own. So they'd taken the name of the emperor. And then when the Gallic Empire collapsed, when it was sort of reconquered by the main Roman Empire, someone... Probably, in fact, the Alice of looked at this inscription and said, "Uh uh-oh, we better get rid of this. I've been talking about this as a breakaway state. I've been talking about Posthumus as a usurper emperor. If you were Posthumus, if you were a member of his crew, of his government, of one of his soldiers, you're not portraying yourself as that. And this is the whole point behind this inscription. It looks like every other inscription that we have from the Roman Empire that does these things, right? These guys were not saying we are setting up a new kind of breakaway state that's doing something really different. We're cutting ourselves off from the Roman Empire. They were not trying to kind of reject the Roman state. They were trying to appropriate it. And we see that in other kind of public facing objects from this period, from this empire. For example, Posthumus's coins. He and the other Gallic emperors minted coins with their heads on them, and they look exactly like the coins from the sort of main Roman Empire. Why do we call them usurpers? Well, we call them usurpers because eventually the emperor who was emperor of the central Roman Empire managed to reconquer this region. Had it gone the other way, we would not be sitting here talking about Posthumus as a usurper, we would be sitting here talking about him. As we talk about Constantine, who was another emperor who was declared emperor of the Roman uh, world by his troops in Britain but then just actually wound up being more successful at that and actually eventually managing to conquer the rest the rest of the empire Ellery told us why this inscription, and others like it, are important for telling the stories of less illustrious people, as well as emperors and consuls. 
there's a there's a kind of more local story hidden here, right? Which is the experience of the soldiers serving in Lancaster in this turbulent period in the third century, when Britain is essentially part of this kind of breakaway revolting state against the main Roman Empire. Well, who was doing the revolting? It was pretty much the army. The, these breakaway emperors, these usurper emperors, were supported by soldiers. So we have the soldiers at Lancaster seemingly you know, pretty complicit and pro this, uh, you know, essentially this kind of mutiny against the Roman state, throwing their hat in with this usurper emperor Posthumus, taking on his name as part of the kind of honorifics of their unit, setting up this inscription, remember a public facing message saying we have rebuilt this horrible dilapidated bathhouse for essentially the glory of this guy under our great breakaway governor, under our great breakaway consuls. So it's through inscriptions like this, most often, that we are able to see what soldiers were serving where in the Roman Empire and to understand kind of the history of the military units that were serving in Britain. In particular, this inscription here is one of our main pieces of evidence for the unit that we think was serving at Lancaster for a significant chunk of the Roman occupation of Lancaster, of the fort's history at Lancaster. And that's this cavalry unit called in Latin the Ala Sabosiana, the cavalry unit of Gauls. And so men, uh, a unit that was originally raised in what is now modern day France in Gaul, but that had been over in Britain, we know from other inscriptions from the kind of late first, first century onwards, early second century onwards, and eventually sort of settled in Lancaster. So it's important to for sort of our knowledge of, of the men that were serving in Lancaster, but also with regards to this specific inscription, thinking about the role of those men and those units in this breakaway Gallic Empire. What other inscriptions have survived from the Roman Empire and what can they tell us about the wider world that Roman Lancaster operated in? So the Romans had what Roman historians like to call the epigraphic habit. And epigraphy is our fancy word for stone inscriptions. And so what we mean when we say the Romans had the epigraphic habit is that they loved to set up inscriptions. They loved to commemorate things with inscriptions. So we have things that, you know, if we think about kind of inscriptions in our own world, we have parallels to the Roman world. So we have lots and lots of tombstones from the Roman world. But we also have other things that they liked to sort of commemorate in stone were dedications of buildings like the inscription that we have here. Uh, one thing that I study a huge amount in my work is Roman altars, so altars that were set up to the gods that would have then a dedication on them saying which god they were to, who had set up the altars, maybe something about the circumstances. Inscriptions that were set up recording in stone letters or edicts written by Roman governors, Roman emperors that communities set up to say look this person wrote to us and delivered a legal judgment. Um, so we have a huge range of texts that were set up on stone from the Roman world. And these tell us about people in the Roman Empire that we don't often see through our written sources. We're still not necessarily seeing the most ordinary people of the Roman Empire because it takes quite a lot of money still to commission one of these inscriptions and to set it up. But certainly we're seeing names, we're seeing people that just don't come down to us in any sort of documentation from the ancient world, don't come down to us in our elite literature, people like, like Virgil or Tacitus or ancient authors. So they're a really important window into a society in the Roman Empire that we would wouldn't see in any other way and into the ways in which that society commemorated things. What goes on them is very intentional, it's sending a message. These are statements of identity, these are statements of, of who we are, what we care about, who we want to connect ourselves to, what kind of image we want to present to our world. And for us as historians that's incredibly important to, to then understand the dynamics of those societies. But the stone still holds a lot of mysteries. Before she left, Ellery explained some of the things that we still don't know about this stone and the world that it came from. One of the things with inscriptions is because they are texts, we tend to sort of feel like, oh, oh, we've got answers, right? We've got names, got historical names that we can sort of put into the historical record. And Roman historians especially kind of get excited about this because we don't have the documentary evidence that we have from other periods. But really names are all we have, right? And so I think both it's important to remember what we don't actually know from this text, from the text itself, 
yes, we figured out now that Kensa and Lepidus must have been consuls of this breakaway empire. We don't know anything else about them. We don't know what their motivations were uh, with regard to that. We don't know what led them to sort of throw their hat in with Posthumus in that way. We don't know what happened to them afterwards. Likewise, at the more local level, we don't know what happened to these soldiers that threw their hat in, whether when the Gallic Empire ended, whether those soldiers were punished, whether, you know, a whole load of new soldiers were recruited to this unit and something bad happened to the ones that had been rebelling. We don't know what their experience really really was of this. So in terms of the kind of the the political story here, there are lots of question marks. But then in terms of this as an object in our museum in Rome and Lancaster, there are also lots of question marks. We're pretty sure that it comes from this bathhouse outside the East Gate, but we're not 100% sure. We don't really know what this basilica building refers to. Probably it refers to a, a training building for the cavalry that's a use that we see of this word, but it's also a word that's often used for kind of public buildings in civic spaces um, in Roman cities. So there's a question mark over that. It's broken. We've restored the text. We're pretty confident about the restoration of the bit that's missing because these inscriptions are so formulaic. But, you know, there's always a little bit of a question mark there. So these question marks over, you know, where exactly was it found? What really were the circumstances here? But also what the story was, both before and after this moment that these guys chose to set in stone. And that second moment when someone came along and chose to chisel out part of what they'd set in stone. Those are the things that we can really only tell stories about, right? We're never really going to know what the answers are there. Thank you for spending this time with us on 100 Years, 100 Objects. Please join us again for more episodes where we will discuss everything from navigation to newspapers. Newspapers.